Hello, and welcome to Physics 157. So this is our first lecture recording. It's not technically a recording of this morning's lecture since we had a few technical issues. And so I thought I would just do it again. And so this is how the lecture should have been. And we're hoping to, to work out the technical issues, but just be aware that we're always going to have a recording of the class after it happens. And so if you ever do have trouble hearing parts of the lecture or you get kicked out or your Wi-Fi is bad, you're always going to be able to come and join the lecture afterwards. And, and so you're not going to miss anything. Okay. So let me start by introducing myself. So that's, that's me. Of course, you can, you can already see me. Uh, on the screen. Uh, one of the advantages of being online is that I, I look fairly close to you if, if we were actually live. Uh, we have our class in a big lecture hall called Heb Theater. And if you happen to be at the back, then I might look very small. And so that's why I put my face on the lecture slide. And uh, so it's a little bit redundant today. Uh, so just before I start, um, maybe I should tell you how to address me. So I'm, my name is Mark Van Ramstonk. Normally at university, you would call your professors doctor and then their last name or professor and their last name. So Dr. Van Ramstonk or Professor Van Ramstonk. But I find that a little bit formal. And so I'm actually totally happy if you want to call me Professor Mark or even Mark, whatever you sort of feel most comfortable with. Um, if, if you want to say Professor Van Ramstonk, then, then that's fine too. Um, uh, Let's see. One thing to tell you is that I was also a UBC student. So I grew up in Victoria. And so when I was applying to universities, I wanted to, I guess, get away from home, but maybe not too far away from home. And so UBC seemed like a really good option and it worked out really well for me. So I, I was an undergraduate in the combined honors math and physics program. So I really liked math when I was in high school. Didn't have such a good physics teacher, but I knew there was interesting physics out there. I'd read a little bit about like special relativity and, and the cool um, modern physics. And so I wanted to learn more about that. I think that's why I signed up for the honors math physics program. And as I went through that, I, I kind of appreciated more and more um, physics and, and how it's like, I was amazed at how we can understand our universe in a very quantitative way using sometimes beautiful mathematics. And I was, I was, I just wanted to understand um, all of it. Like how much can we really say, can we, can we understand, um, can we understand everything just somehow with mathematics? And, and so that led me into this career in theoretical physics. And so I went on to graduate school in Princeton and I ended up studying string theory, which, which is sort of a, uh, a, uh, idea that can maybe help unify our understanding of various particles and forces in nature. Um, my research nowadays is related to string theory. And I guess the specific physical things that I'm, I'm focused on have to do with gravity and specifically how, how quantum mechanics and gravity interact with each other. And so in terms of physical applications, the place where we need to understand both gravity and quantum mechanics at the same time is um, is when you have like super high densities of, of matter. And so the, the big two examples are understanding the physics of black holes and understanding the big bang in the early universe and understanding cosmology. So, so those are the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about in my research and with talking to my graduate students and writing papers. So I'd be happy to talk more about any of those things to, to you guys at office hours if you come and ask me. All right, so another thing about me, uh, at least I like to think that I am not scary. So that's important for you because um, I want you to feel comfortable talking to me. Um, one of the things that you find going from high school to university is that whereas in high school, you might have found most things to be fairly easy or you know, various subjects that you took probably didn't give you too much trouble. You probably ended up with very good grades. Otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, when you get to university, 
everyone is going to struggle with at least some things. And so it's really important to, to kind of realize that early on and realize that if you're not understanding something, then it's okay to admit it and to, and to get help. And, and so uh, talking to me after class or before class or in office hours is, is one good way to get help. On our Canvas page, we have various other suggestions. You can certainly talk to your other, your, your fellow students. You can talk to TAs, you can post on Piazza. Um, so there's lots of ways to get help. Um, but uh, I wanna emphasize that, you know, I'm definitely never here to, to kind of judge you. It, I, I won't even really be able to, you know, specifically know uh, who, who you are or, uh, and, or correlate that with, with your grades. Um, I, my, my goal is just to help you understand whatever it is that you're trying to understand at the moment. Okay. Um, so anyways, the bottom line, feel free to, to come and talk to me. I, I um, always enjoy any kind of question. I thought I would tell you a little bit about myself, just other than other than physics. Uh, what what am I interested in? Um, in case you you feel like chatting about that. Um, so when I'm when I'm not working, um, some of the things that I enjoy are music. I I play the saxophone. Actually, ever since high school, I've played the saxophone, and uh, so I'm always trying to to get a little bit better um, in terms of wh what kind of music. Um, I like to play everything, but uh, especially jazz. I have a, a friend who plays piano. And so the two of us often, often play together. Um, and I really like the improvisational aspects of music. Um, other things, uh, I like outdoor activities. So Vancouver is a beautiful place and, and there's many wonderful op opportunities for hiking and, and running and swimming in the ocean and uh, biking. So I, especially during this, during this last few months, um, I've really gotten into just biking all over the place in town. Um, sometimes I also like being outside at night. So ever since I was maybe in elementary school, I was very interested in amateur astronomy. So just fascinated to look up at the stars and with my eyes or binoculars or a telescope and kind of see, see what's up there. Um, I was actually a member of the UBC astronomy club when I was, a uh, a student here. Um, one of the highlights of my summer actually combined the the last two things. So so being outdoors and and looking at the stars. Um, we had an opportunity to go camping up near Pemberton, BC, which is a, a few hours north of Vancouver. And that happened to be right when Comet Neowise was visible. And so I was really lucky to be in a very dark sky location and to be able to observe the comet. And this is a picture that I took. Uh, I have a just a digital SLR camera that I've had for a while. And so I was, I was up there in this really dark site. Um, we could see the comet, um, but when I took a picture with a longer exposure, uh, it was just amazing what, what you could see. And, and so you can see like these two different tails and all the stars around. So it was, it was very exciting for me. Um, what else? Uh, and then, yeah, I guess, I guess I like to, cook. Um, uh, it's possible that it's just that I like to eat lots of different interesting things. Uh, I'm not sure if I would still like to cook if I didn't get to eat the things. Um, all right. Let me say a little bit about this platform. Um, so many of you already participated in, in one of the trial sessions or in this morning's class um, with, with the Remo platform. I'm I'm really hoping it's going to work out and that we resolve all the, the technical issues. Um, just to, to say a little bit about, about why I chose this platform. Um, so we can go back and forth in this class using this platform between this, which is presenter mode, where you see me and you see my slides. And then I can go to the discussion mode. So we can go to the mode where you just see people at your table. Okay, so what I really like about this platform is that you can enter a class in the morning before the class starts, see all of the various tables. You can choose to sit at a particular table and maybe you'll be at a table with people that you're comfortable with or people you wanna to get to know. And then during the class, when I have questions for the class to discuss, uh, then, then you'll be able to have a small group discussion hopefully with people that you're comfortable with talking to and, and 
we can go back and forth. And, and in that way, I hope to make the classes in interactive and more like a real classroom. Um, one of the important things in order to use this is that when you, when you do join the class and you're participating, I think it's important to, to not be afraid to share your video and share your microphone. Um, it's important to, for other people to be able to see you as they would in a real classroom. Um, so it's, it's going to be, I think, very beneficial for us all to kind of get to know each other and actually interact um, as the as the semester goes on. Okay. Um, one of the things that we have in this uh, in this presenter mode is you'll see there's a there's a chat. And so the chat is a place where if you have a question while I'm talking, um, you could ask your question in the chat. Another thing you could do is ask your question in the Q&A panel. And another thing you could do is actually just raise your hand and I will, I will see that. Um, but if you ask your question in the chat, then we have a TA a teach, uh, who's a graduate student um, who will be present in our classes and he will be monitoring that chat and answering questions as they come up. Um, so that would be one option for asking a question. So I think a, a very important thing that we discovered this morning is that it's kind of important not to overuse the chat. So save the chat for your specific content related questions. Um, I think this morning when I invited everyone to answer a question in the chat, it, it crashed the system a little bit. Um, so we're gonna maybe save the chat just for if you have a specific question that you want the TA to answer. Okay, so I'm gonna jump to um, like, what is this course about? And so in order to introduce that, I'm going to actually start with a demo. And so as I, oops, as I mentioned this morning, um, I know this is maybe the, one of the first university classes for all of you. And so I wanted to have like a, a really memorable demo. So, so this will be memorable in that it might be the dumbest demo that you'll, you'll ever see in university. Um, but it's still pedagogically, uh, pedagogically. So for teaching purposes, it's going to be very useful. Okay, so let's get that started. Um, I will just make some space here. And then I have the demo down here. I'm just going to bring it up to the table in a moment. There we go. Getting that set up. Okay. So here we go. Okay. And as I said this morning, you know, it's important to, uh, it's important to put safety first here. So we get, I'm, I'm not a, an experimental scientist, so I may not be fully familiar with all of the usual safety equipment, but I found, I found this helmet and, and the, these are the oven mitts of science. Okay. So I'm ready to start the demo and, uh, well, I'll tell you really when the demo starts. So here we go. Uh, I've got a, a cooler and um, looks, looks like it's very cold inside. And so starting the demo, here we go. And I'm going down. There we go. I should move my microphone out of the way. Okay, so the demo is starting now, okay. I think it's safe to remove the safety equipment at this point. Um, so, of course, I want this not just to be you watching the demo, I want you to think about the demo. And so I got a couple of questions for you. So question number one is, um, what do you see? So maybe just if you're watching this at home, and it's the first time you've seen it, maybe just take a, a minute to record your observations. You could pause the video, um, write down your, your observations of what's going on with, with, with the demo. Um, and so I'll, I'll pause for a moment to let you do that. Okay, so, so I, I, this morning in, in the class, I, I now, after a short time, invited the class to post in the chat what, what their observations were. And many people, unfortunately, I think too many people 
um, were, were eager to, to write that they observed a brick. And, and that was the, really the correct answer. That was what I was looking for. Uh, this is in fact a brick. And I, I, I kind of like this question as, as your, your first question as a UBC engineer, I kind of felt like, well, it's going to be important as an engineer to be able to recognize a brick when you see a brick. So I was happy that many people got that right, even though there were so many people that typed it into the chat that, that the system seemed to have problems. Okay. Well, that wasn't the main point of the demo though. So, so the most important point of this demo was in, in this part. Okay, so, so the real point of this demo uh, was to think about the question of what might be going on here that we can't see. So even though we look at it, more or less, it's a brick sitting there. But the important thing is that there's actually really a lot happening here. And so I want you to think about it for a while. Again, if this is the first time seeing it, please pause the video. Think about your knowledge of physics. You know, think about me taking the brick out of the out of this cooler, um, which had which had a little bit of dry ice, keeping it cool, putting the brick on the table. Um, and so I, I claim there's really a lot going on. And so I want you to think about that for for a little bit. Um, pause your video, write things down. And, and then we're going to come back and talk about it. Okay. okay. Well, I never actually left. Here I am again. Uh, hopefully you did take the time to think about this on your own and record some observations. Um, I wrote down this morning what, what some of the responses were. So I brought some people up to the front of the class and I invited them to tell me about what, what they and the people at their table thought about when, when, they, were think, when they were dealing with this question. Um, and so I think the first thing that came up was that, well, there's, there's something that is changing about the brick um, as, as the demo is proceeding, and that is that we expect that the brick is getting warmer. It was in a cooler with ice. Now we've taken it out of the cooler. And so there is, there is some warming going on. And there's different ways to talk about that, that there's, there's some heat, that heat is going into the brick. Um, the, the, specifically, we can say the temperature of the brick is increasing. And that's because there's, there's some heat from the air going into the brick. Um, some people brought up the idea that we might be moving towards the situation of thermal equilibrium that we'll be talking about pretty soon. Um, some people talked about how that might actually influence some other properties of the brick. So it would suggest that, that maybe as the brick gets warmer, maybe actually um, there's some subtle expansion of the brick. Okay, so that's actually true if, if you were to observe the length of the brick very closely. Um, it might, uh, you, you would see that it's expanding very slightly as it gets warmer. Um, other people talked about specific ways in which heat is going, is being transferred into, or sorry, out of, into the brick. Yeah. Um, and so in terms of, um, in terms of various mechanisms, one of the people, one of the things that came up was that you have conduction of heat. So heat going directly from, from the top of the cooler into the brick. Um, another thing was that, well, maybe there's also, um, this, this convective effect that, that the air around the brick might be, might be moving. So warmer air might be, um, might be coming in and, and getting cooled down. And, and so some of the heat is actually physically transferred by the motion of air. Um, another thing that you, you may have heard of in the past, um, that's, that's not at all obvious in this case is, is that. Um, there's, there's some radiation um, involved here. So actually light is hitting the brick. Um, the brick is reflecting some of that light. And also the brick is, um, is, is radiating. Um, even, even, if, even if there were no ambient light, the brick would be radiating some radiation, some thermal radiation. And, and that's part of how energy is being transferred from the brick to the room. Okay. So then actually people brought up that um, it, at the microscopic level, there are, there are 
things happening as well. And some of these microscopic things directly tie into what's going on at the um, at sort of at the macroscopic level in terms of this heat flow and temperature change. We can actually describe all of that um, in terms of the atoms and molecules. Okay, so this is really interesting to think about at the at the atomic level. So when we talk about something being warm, it, it really has to do with the molecules of the brick vibrating. They have a certain amount of kinetic energy there, even though it's a solid, the molecules are not just sitting there, they're actually moving around. And as you as you have heat up the brick, as the brick warms up in the room, the molecules of the brick actually start moving faster. What causes those things to move faster? Well, part of it is that you have air molecules around the brick that are warmer than the molecules in the brick. And those air molecules keep hitting the brick from all sides and transferring some of their kinetic energy to the molecules of the brick. So on average, a war the, the molecules in the air, when they collide with the brick, they transfer some of their energy to the brick and not the other way around. It's the same thing with the cooler. If the cooler is warmer than the brick, then the molecules at the surface of the cooler, they're vibrating and they're, they're banging into molecules at the bottom of the brick. And on average, if the, if the cooler is a little bit warmer, then the molecules in the cooler are going to be hitting the molecules in the brick and transferring some of their energy to the brick. Okay. And then we have this, this radiation from, from a, a microscopic point of view. What's happening is that you have photons, you have, you have or, or electromagnetic waves, and, and they are hitting the brick and hitting the molecules in the brick. And on average, um, they're, they're giving more energy to the brick than it is giving off. Okay, so the, the brick itself is um, the, these hot moving molecules, when they, when they move around and collide, they actually produce some radiation. But since the brick is cooler than the room, on average, it's, it's going to be absorbing more radiation than it's, it's emitting. Okay, um, so that was, that's sort of one whole set of phenomena that have to do with really the random motions of molecules in the brick. But there's even another part of the story that we haven't touched on yet, and that is that there are also uh, there are also motions of the molecules that that aren't random, that are that are um, what we would call collective motions of large groups of molecules. And so the reason that you have those collective motions is that well, part of the reason is that I'm talking, and um, and so. When I'm talking, what happens is that that sends sort of certain types of sound waves that collide with the brick. So that means that, you know, in, basically in a sound wave, uh, we're going to have large groups of air molecules moving together. And so you might have times of higher pressure and lower pressure. And what happens is that that sets up oscillations of the molecules in the brick. So the thermal motion of the molecules, it's all very random. But then on top of that, you have you have sort of back and forth uh, collective motions of the molecules in the brick. And so, so if I talk, then there's actually a sound wave that gets set up inside the brick and that would be bouncing back and forth. And if, if there are people walking around in my house, then those also set up vibrations in the brick. Okay. And so, um, so the main point is that, that there's actually, even though this is the world's most boring demo, I just put a brick on a cooler, um, there's actually really a lot going on if we start thinking about the, the actual physics of this situation. And, and, and this is kind of what we want to understand in this course. We want to be able to look at physical systems um, and understand really what's going on with them, maybe microscopically and, and, and in terms of um, things like temperature and entropy and, uh, and so forth that... Um, we'll see are related to average microscopic properties. Okay, so I have a little bit of a, let's see, I have a slide here just to sh give you um, a little bit more of a picture there. So that's just a picture of what I, what I was saying that, you know, even though the brick itself, uh, we can't really see anything if we could zoom in to actually see the atoms and the molecules. There would be really a lot going on. And so, so these are the thermal aspects. Um, 
with with all the vibrations and the inter the collisions with the air molecules and the collisions with photons and electromagnetic waves. Um, and, and that's really the subject of thermodynamics. So that's the first part of our course. We want to understand um, some way of, of uh, describing these very complicated random uh, motions of, of parts of your objects. Okay. Um, and then the, the second part of the course, it has to do with oscillations and waves. And from a microscopic point of view, as I said, this has to do with the collective motions of the molecules and thinking about sound waves in the brick or vibrations in the brick. And we can, you know, the same mathematics applies to more fundamental kinds of, of, of waves um, that, that don't involve molecules. So, so, for example, light rays and gravitational waves um, that, there, you know, there's a lot about in the news lately. Okay, so in the last couple of slides, I, I just wanted to maybe uh, give a bit of an advertisement for physics in general. And, and so somehow the point of this demo is, was that um, th there's a lot going on um, that, that we can't see. And, and amazingly, so physics is going to allow us to understand all of that in a very precise and quantitative way. So one of the things that I, I'm most amazed about with, with physics is, is that you can talk about things that are happening in this brick um, that are just way, way beyond our, our human ability to perceive. So, you know, we could think about zooming in a um, hundred million times and then there, there are atoms there and we could zoom in another hundred thousand times and you would have the nucleus of the atom and we could zoom in even more and understand um, internal structure of protons and neutrons. And, and so by, you know, our, our last centuries of, of doing physics and science, um, we've now come to understand in quantitative detail, the physics of all of those things. Um, so even when, when you zoom all the way in, like hundreds of trillions of times smaller than we can see with our eye, then we have precise equations that describe exactly what is going on inside that proton. And we can do experiments in particle colliders, for example, um, to test our understanding of nature. And um, essentially all of the experiments we've done um, in, in particle physics, we can, we can explain that using, using the mathematics. Um, physics is not only useful for understanding very small things, we can also understand very large things. And so one of the amazing things is that, you know, even though we're, we're just small things stuck on, on a particular planet, uh, we really understand the physics of our solar system, of our galaxy, of clusters of galaxies, and in fact, of the whole universe. And, and so understanding these rules of physics has allowed us to, to say just completely mind blowing things like, you know, that we understand how the universe began 13 and a half billion years ago. And we can with confidence say, you know, exactly what it, what was it like in the universe uh, 10 to the minus 25 seconds after the big bang or one second after the big bang or 300,000 uh, years after the big bang, even though all of this was 13 billion years ago. Um, so, so our precise understanding of, of physics, our understanding of the mathematical rules, um, underlying nature allows us to, to do all of these things. Okay. And, you know, in terms of um, what is that good for? Um, so, you know, it's not just to satisfy our curiosity um, at a technical level, we can actually, um, we can actually make use of all of this. And so knowing these laws allows us to predict what's going to happen uh, in the future, given, given some initial situation. Like if I send a if I want to send a space probe out to, to Pluto to observe Pluto, then I can use the laws of physics that we understand um, in order to know, you know exactly what direction should we send it in and how much um, initial velocity. And, and then we could predict exactly where it's going to go and arrange things so that it will, it will end up um, at Pluto with you know, using the least amount of, of fuel, for example. Um, I already mentioned that you know, we can understand um, we can understand the past of our universe if, if we know these laws very precisely. And finally, you know, as, 
engineers, one of the things we want to do is use our knowledge of these laws of physics to, to make, uh, make very useful things for humanity. Okay. Useful and, and fun things like, like iPhones. Um, but, but, you know, also all sorts of computer technology, um, any kind of technology we're, we're using our knowledge of physics in order to say, okay, I know what will happen if, if we do this thing, or if we put these components together, uh, we can use our knowledge of physics to, um, to say what will happen or, or to, to, to design a device. Okay, um, so that's pretty much it for the, the content of today. In the last couple of slides, I just wanted to mention uh, a couple of practical things. And so I think by now everyone has found our Canvas site. This is what it looks like um, if you, if you haven't explored it very much, you know, the important thing would be to follow this link in red. I don't know if you can see my cursor there, but follow the link in red. Ah, here it is. Um, and do all of the things on that list. Um, part of that, that is your first reading quiz. Um, so you're going to have um, a reading quiz due Monday, which is mostly just getting you to read some of these things and learning about the course, the practical information about, about taking this class. Today, I'm also going to post an actual reading assignment. Um, so that will, that will show up um, somewhere here. And that will be a little bit of reading to get you ready for next week. So that will be part of chapter 17. And that's pretty much what you need to do for this week. But we're going to sort of keep updating you um, on this Canvas page about all of the things you'll need. Down here at the bottom, um, you see a week by week list. And if you click on those links, th that's where you're going to see the reading assignment for this week. Um, that's where we'll post the lecture slides and, and videos. That's where we'll post the tutorials, the, the homeworks. Um, so we'll just on a week by week basis have all of that information there for you. Okay. And my last slide, uh, I just wanted to again invite people to you know come don't don't be shy come introduce yourself if you like um, and I'm going to try to be available a lot in this class so before and after class every class on the Remo platform and then I'll also have some separate office hours um, so you can find these on the Canvas page my office hours at least for the time being and probably they'll stay like this the whole year I'm going to have some office hours on Friday from 3:30 to 4:30. And I put a Zoom link on the Canvas page, uh, and I'm going to have office hours on Mondays uh, from four to five, and then from eight to nine in order to try to accommodate people in in various different time zones. Okay, so so with one of those options, everyone should have a chance to to talk to me, and this is just a good opportunity to come and ask questions about the material, about the homework, or early on just come and you know tell me something about yourself. Um, all right, well, that's it. And so thanks for watching. So we'll be posting similar videos like this. Uh, hopefully in the future, there'll be actual recordings of the class so I don't have to give the class twice, but this wasn't so bad. And uh, I, think, uh, I think it'll be a good record of what we did today. Bye-bye.